Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. My name is John St. Louis. I'm the Director of Marketing here at CR Wall. Uh, I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time this morning to attend today's presentation on odorization for renewable natural gas. Uh, our presenter today is Garrett Cox from Link Energy Systems based out of Lakewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Uh, Garrett has worked for Link Energy Systems for seven years, specializing in gas measurement, regulation, and odorization. Uh, outside of the office, he enjoys spending time with his three dogs, his wife, Andrea, and his daughter, Olivia. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before I hand it over to Garrett. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them using the chat or Q&A feature found in the Zoom taskbar. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them in real time during the presentation. Also, we do have a couple of polls throughout the presentation, which you will see as a simple pop-up on the screen. So we encourage you to take part in those as well. Uh, I would now like to hand it over to Garrett for today's presentation. Garrett. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Um, again, I'll, I'll echo John. I appreciate uh, everybody's time this morning. Um, and uh, again, just kind of preface what we're talking about today, uh, just talking about, you know, uh, some of the, the challenges of uh, renewable natural gas uh, odorization and how, you know, we've we've worked to uh, solve some of those challenges um, and, and what we're looking at towards the future. So without further ado here, I'll, I'll start our presentation. Um, and I will apologize in advance here. I got a bit of a cold. Uh, yesterday, so I, I may at some point pass over to uh, my cohort, Russ Isaac, uh, who's our national sales manager, um, but uh, we'll see how it goes here. <clears throat> so first thing we're just going to talk about are, are our typical uh, RNG applications. Typically, you know, when we're odorizing, we're seeing four, uh, four different types of uh, RNG. So our first one is going to be our landfill. Obviously, um, as uh, you know, trash is discarded, um, it is moved to a landfill, um, and that methane uh, is captured when that organic waste uh, decomposes um, under anaerobic conditions. Second is going to be our wastewater. Um, this is going to be at our water treatment plants. Um, so again, we're going to be using that same anaerobic digestion, um, but we're going to be treating the sewage instead of uh, organic waste. Um, and then we're going to, from there, we will generate biogas, and then that would go to a conditioning skid uh, where we get our uh, line gas um, and our RNG. Third is going to be our livestock farms. Again, anaerobic digestion, um, but we're going to be uh, using animal waste uh, to convert it into biogas and then subsequently move it uh, through our skid uh, and, and make it pipeline quality. And then the fourth is going to be a combination of, you know, one or two of the top uh, um, biogas um, applications that we're looking at. So again, you're going to use anaerobic digestion, but this is going to be a combination. So you could have a wastewater plant that is also doing, you know, organic waste, or you could have a, you know, a livestock farm that is also doing that organic waste. So again, those are going to be our, our four typical um, applications that we see and, and that we've currently been working on projects uh, throughout the United States. So here's our here's our first poll here. And again, what what is a typical odorization method for RNG sites? So we just kind of want to get get an idea of um, you know what is typically being used out there um, in the field at this point. Okay, so it looks, looks like we've got kind of a, a mix uh, between uh, bypass and sweep, and then I don't know. So um, that's good. It looks like it's a little bit lower on the injection side. So uh, what we will be talking about today is, is the injection side of things um, and kind of what, uh, what advantages that does have. Um, and, and for those that don't know, we're going to educate you on, on what we can offer and kind of what we've been offering um, up to this point uh, in the industry. So what we're going to start with is, is kind of lessons learned and, and what we've learned in the field, uh, and we've we've been doing um, wastewater odorization, or biogas odorization, RNG um, for over three years now. So um, I wanted to just talk about the different challenges that we've seen um, being involved in these projects and kind of how we've worked to solve those challenges. So. The first one is really just the overall complexity of, of producing not only biogas, but once we do get that lower quality biogas, making it ready for our pipeline, right? 
if we're doing an interconnect, uh, obviously we're going to have you know stringent gas quality standards uh, as you would typically have on any kind of pipeline gas. Um, so with that and, and what you can see down here, you know this is going to be uh, conditioning and compression skid. Um, very very complex. We've got filters, we've got compressors, um, and I believe this also would have an analyzer on it as well. If it didn't, uh, sometimes they're ancillary, um, but you will have um, gas quality analyzers as well. So what this leads to is, is a lot of complex parts. And, and again, there is, uh, you know, some room for downtime as well. We've got a lot of moving pieces. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to see that, that these uh, sites can, you know, go down frequently just because there are so many moving parts to this, uh, to this skid to actually condition the gas. Another thing that we see, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these, uh, especially if they're newer projects, we see that the gas that they're producing um, and, and actually injecting into the um, gas company pipeline, we're not talking about a lot, a lot of volume. But even though we are not talking about a lot of volume, there is still extremely high consequences uh, to improperly odorizing that gas. Um, we've seen a few different instances where We've got these small interconnects um, and something happens so either they're not doing proportional to flow odorization to start. Um, they're trying to do, you know, odorization using some other equipment um, where they may not have alarm handling. They may not have, you know, be able to take flow signals into, uh, into the gas. They may not be monitoring um, as closely as they should. Um, and, and you'll get over odorization uh, in this very small part uh, of this line from a volume standpoint. Um, but anybody who's been involved with any over odorization event uh, knows that it doesn't take but you know very very strongly odorized small volume gas to get into your system uh, and then start to cause nuisance leak calls um, and really unwanted publicity because um, your odorant is not going to burn off at the burner tip um, because you've got too much saturation in the odorant uh, and that's going to lead to uh, gas smell in the house. And although it is a nuisance, it still is gas in the house and, and typically is uh, a lot of emergency uh, response, um, both from, you know, local fire um, departments and then obviously with the gas company. Another challenge, and we kind of touched on it in the, that first slide when we were talking about the challenges, but just the system upsets uh, due to the complexity of these RNG conditioning skids, right? We've got a lot of different components. Um, a lot of times when we're taking that biogas as well, we've got, you know, H2S um, and, and other uh, gases that are not kind on equipment. Obviously, most everything is uh, stainless and Viton uh, and Teflon in these skids. But because they are so complex and there's so many moving parts to them, we see a lot of times that uh, these units, these skids can go down, you know, very, very frequently. Um, and, and when that happens, there's a couple things that happen. When your odorizer goes down, if you've got, you know, something like a pneumatic pump uh, or an electrohydraulic pump or even a centrifugal pump, any pump that needs to be actuated at a certain uh, period of time, we see that these pumps go down. So not only are you having to restart your RNG conditioning skid, then you're going to have to restart your odorizer um, before you can start delivering gas uh, into the pipeline. <clears throat> Another thing that we see is a lot of these RNG contracts uh, actually contain clauses that, that will penalize the facility owner if they're not producing that gas. Um, and typically it's you know 24 or 48 hour period. Um, so what that means is, is we need stuff that's easy to troubleshoot on the odorization side and easy, easy to get back up because again, we're just a very small cog in the entire RNG conditioning wheel. And we wanna make sure that, that our customers, uh, you know, it's not an issue to get the odorizer back up. That the odorizer is either A, ready to go even after system upset, or B, uh, very, very easy to um, get back up and running uh, because you, typically operators are going to be spending a lot of time on the other side of things on the RNG uh, skit. Another challenge is just, you know, these plant operators. So we see it a mix. Sometimes uh, it'll be the gas company's responsibility uh, to maintain um, and operate the odorizer. And sometimes it's going to be the facility owner. 
So if it's going to be the facility owner, obviously, you know, our, our plant operators of, you know, a wastewater facility, um, say, they're very familiar with, with blowers, with pumps, with compressors, you know, they're very mechanically inclined. But because odorization is such a, a niche market and really a, a specialized skill, um, especially outside of the wastewater world, obviously, um, we find that there's a lot of lack of knowledge uh, in terms of how to operate an odorizer, um, why we're odorizing, how we're odorizing. Um, so again, that goes back to uh, making something that's simple to operate uh, and also <clears throat> providing, excuse me, uh, providing startup and training for customers and also 24 seven support uh, for these operators. We got another poll here. Okay, so so kind of looking at a poll again, a, a lot of a lot of I don't knows, but uh, looks like you know over utterization and start stop oper operation are kind of tied for for the known problems. Um, so again, we'll, we'll go over uh, you know with with our equipment uh, and really over utterization is is a huge huge issue, and obviously the stop started is, is as well. Um, so we'll go over how we kind of tackle both of those. Um, that is really where our equipment shines is in both of those, uh, both of those categories. Um, so keep moving on here. So now we're going to go into, uh, our, our solution, uh, for, for these, for all the issues that we, we mentioned earlier in this presentation. So, uh, what you're looking at here, uh, is our GPL 750, uh, odorization system, as I've mentioned. Um, we've had, uh, we're about four years in on uh, RNG facilities in terms of utilizing this odorizer. Um, although it wasn't originally designed for RNG applications, it was designed for uh, low to intermediate flow um, delivery points, uh, you know, smaller city gate stations, uh, factories, that sort of thing. Uh, this odorizer really is the, the solution. Uh, for these RNG facilities because we typically have lower flows, we have stop start uh, operation, and then we have, you know, uh, operators who may not be as familiar with odorization equipment. So um, it really fit right into that niche um, at, as soon as we released it to, to the RNG market. Uh, just a quick overview of what we're looking at. We'll, we'll go in depth of what, you know, what components do what here, um, but it is a two box system. So you've got your electronics over here. You've got your mechanicals over here. The reason we do have it as a two box system is because the injection is actually a gravity fed drip system. So this mechanical side will need to be over your pipeline uh, or next to the pipeline with a 45 degree angle. So as the drops fall in the sight glass here that they move down this tube and into the line. Um, so we, we need to have that uh, mechanical box over our pipeline to make sure that we can drip in and uh, odorize appropriately. Just a little bit of a background of the, of the technology. Um, this drip style odorization has been around and that's a 15 plus, but now we're, we're going on 20 plus years. Uh, a man by the name of Mark Zeck, um, who was actually the Z in YZ, um, spun off and decided to do his own thing. He, he saw a, a hole in the market um, and that was this low flow, uh, low pressure odorization. Um, and that's when he came out with what he called the Z9000, which is a, a drip style unit um, that had a, a servo motor and a, um, <clears throat> a modulating valve and, and basically would constantly drip into the pipeline and the valve would move the, uh, the motor, move the valve up and down to meet uh, downstream demand. Um, 2015 Link Energy Systems, uh, who is uh, 30 plus years in the Rocky Mountain area, um, is a distributor for um, metering and regulation equipment, uh, most notably Honeywell and uh, ITRON, uh, Honeywell on the metering side and ITRON on the regulation side. Um, purchased the business, moved everything uh, into Lakewood, Colorado, um, and really kind of brought our own uh, culture to this, to this product. Um, so again, you know, we're very, very service oriented. 
Uh, we understand that, you know, people aren't working on odorizers every day, especially in this realm of RNG. Um, and we want to work to help our customers, whether it be training um, and also that 24 seven support um, that I mentioned. So again, from the drip style technology, we started with the Z9000 when we brought the company to Denver uh, or to Lakewood, we uh, started working on the GPL 750, which basically uses all of the technology that the Z9000 used, um, but we were able to, obviously being a 15 year old technology, we were able to bring improvements uh, in terms of interface and also sim simplifying um, from our field experience over the past few years. Hey Garrett, uh, it's, it's Mike Dillon. Uh, hey Mike. We've got a, uh, how are you? We've got a quick uh, question in. Uh, can the unit be used for no flow conditions? So the, the unit can, operate in, in a no flow condition uh, and I, I think maybe the, the question and if uh, if maybe uh, I believe it was Catherine if, if you maybe want to clarify a little bit are, are you kind of talking stop start like uh, if you had something where maybe you don't flow for 12 hours or something is that kind of what we're alluding to and if the unit can go back up after that And I'm, I'm not I, sure. I do. I do expect that's the case, though. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So. So again, the 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 beauty of this differential pressure style system, um, we'll go into it a little bit more here as the presentation progresses, is that um, because our driving force is differential pressures, we're not using pneumatics, we're not using hydraulics, we're not using electronics. Um, we're able to, uh, if the odorizer does experience no flow conditions. Uh, essentially what we're doing is, is just like putting your, uh, your finger on the top of a straw that has liquid in it, right? So we, we can essentially sit indefinitely uh, until we're waiting for, for more flow um, from a no flow condition. So again, one of the biggest limiting factors of the, the Z9000 that was originally introduced to this market is that it doesn't do very well in flows under 15,000. So really the, the rangeability of this unit Okay, so yeah, so it's a new new steel pipe service without flow for a period of time. So yes, that's that's really where this unit excels, and that's where the design of this unit came about um, was to be able to basically sit on a pipeline uh, and and not operate for you know twelve hours a day, uh, two days, even a week, um, and actually just sit stagnant. Uh, and then when gas uh, is reinitiated, the odorizer will turn back on. The system is going to be self priming because we're differential pressures uh, and that's uh, and, and we're, we're able to odorize moving forward without any intervention. So, uh, Catherine, if you wouldn't mind just maybe typing in if that if that answered your question here and then uh, if there are any uh, other follow up questions, obviously, uh, you can reach out to uh, the CR wall team here. All right, perfect. We'll move on here. Um, so again, just, just some design considerations for this 750, right? We wanted to make it simple. We wanted to make it easy, easy to operate, easy to interface with. Looks like, okay, fantastic. So that plant, uh, question was answered. We also wanted hourly logs, right? As, as uh, especially if it's the operators, uh, if it falls on our operator, um, our planner operator, uh, we really want to be able to uh, have them prove that what you know what they've been injecting and in, in their injection rate is actually uh, what we're looking for. So those hourly logs are going to log our uh, odorant used and our gas flow, um, and from there we can derive. Uh, what our injection rate is. Uh, we also have monthly logs as well. So again, this is really just for compliance um, and everything is actually stored on a micro SD right on board the, uh, the controller, which means that and then it's a 16 gigabyte uh, micro, US, micro SD. So um, we've got years and years of data uh, and years and years of archives that we can look at. Also wanted to focus on replacing any machine parts in the unit uh, with basically commercial components from you know peter paul which is a very uh long-standing uh, solenoid company 
companies like Swedlock, really proven components in the industry that are mass produced at a level that we cannot. Um, so what we found with a lot of our machine components in our early system, our 9,000, was that there was a lot of variability, which can tend to lead to some uh, differences in operation of each unit. So we wanted something that every unit that goes off of our floor operates the same so that we're easier to troubleshoot and we create continuity with our customers, especially as, as we uh, install these units across their um, motorization uh, area. Continuous drip mode, again, this unit is not going to be continuously dripping into the pipeline. It's gonna be used what's called the batch odorization. So it's going to wait for a certain amount of gas to flow. Once that certain amount of gas has uh, flown through the pipeline, flown through the meter, uh, we are injecting um, a proportional amount of odorant to uh, meet the demand of whatever gas has flowed downstream. And again, uh, and kind of going back to uh, the question earlier, we wanted to focus on solving those odoriz odorization issues at the extremely low flows, so a thousand cubic feet and below. And because we have that differential pressure style uh, unit, we do have a self-priming unit as long as all pressures are set uh, appropriately. This is just a quick PNID of uh, what we're looking at from the system internally. Uh, so obviously we've got our odorant supply tank. Uh, as I mentioned, because we have, uh, we're using differential pressure style, um, our limiting factor is our pressure rating on the tank. So typically your pressure rating on your tank is gonna be ASME 250, uh, unless we go with the custom tank. Uh, but ASME 250 is uh, pretty standard across the industry for odorant supply tanks. So. What that means is, and let's just say for, uh, for our sake here that our pipeline is 100 pounds uh, on the RNG side. What we're gonna need to do, and again, we can use nitrogen, or if we do have a pressure cut, we can use gas from the upstream side, the high pressure side of the pressure cut. We will need to regulate this blanket gas for the odorant uh, 15 to 20 pounds above our pipeline pressure. So again, if we've got our pipeline here at 100 pounds, we would put our odorant supply tank at 115 or 120. So that way we have our driving force for our odorant to move from our supply tank through our filter here uh, to the inlet of our liquid regulator. Um, and this is where kind of we're unique in terms of uh, not having a lot of adjustments to this regulator. So again, you've got 15 to 20 pounds over pipeline here coming to our regulator and our regulator, we're going to set five to 10 pounds over our pipeline pressure. So if we've got hundred pounds on the pipeline, We'll have 120 on our tank, and then we'll have uh, either 105 or 110 on our regulator. Now, what makes this unique is we actually have a sensing line for this liquid regulator that's connected to our pipeline. Uh, again, this is all internal, and I'll show you in a picture of where that sense line actually is. It's not something that needs to be installed external to the unit. Um, but what this allows us to do is as pipeline pressures change, we're actually loading this regulator with whatever that pipeline pressure is. So what this allows us to do is we're able to um, accommodate when as pipeline pressures fluctuate, right? If it's a shutdown condition, if it's a startup condition, if we if we sag off a little bit because of flow, um, you know, demand downstream, if we kick up a little bit because of demand downstream falls, our regulator is going to uh, catch that because we've got the pipeline pressure right on the dome. And then our spring is only adding that five to 10 pounds of spring force over our pipeline. So again, this is not something that needs to be adjusted uh, regularly as long as your odor and supply tank is over whatever you would see in this pipeline. Um, so again, we're done loading that regulator or five to 10 pounds. From there, we're moving to the bottom of our solenoid, which is gonna be normally closed, obviously normally closed for safety if the power does go out um, the solenoid is going to fail close, so we're not dripping odor in, into the pipeline, uh, which is obviously very important, especially on these low uh, and intermittent flow applications. From the solenoid, we've got our metering valve here. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about our metering valve is the metering valve controls uh, drip speed only. It does not control the drip size. The drip size off of our uh, blunt 16th inch tube is always gonna be 0.01 cc's. This metering valve, and again, just a fixed metering valve, it's not a modulating valve, uh, is going to control our drip speed only. So 
um, come in here and this is that loop that you saw in that first picture of the mechanical uh, cabinet we come into our drip chamber so this is really the technology uh, the patented technology behind this drip style odorization so you've got our optical comparator here that is sending an infrared signal one transmit on this side across this drip chamber to our receive side and back to the comparator so as these drips fall and we the drips fall through this horizontal beam, this optical comparator is seeing that signal lots on that beam and sending information back to our controller saying that odor and drops have fallen. So essentially, if, if this was on a pipeline, right, we've got our four to 20 here coming into our controller. Our controller is going to wait for a certain amount of gas to flow um, before it's injected odorant. After that certain amount of gas has flown, it's going to uh, send a signal to our solenoid to open up, which is going to introduce this odorant through the drip chamber across these infrared, this infrared signal here and into our pipeline. Our comparator, which is counting our drops, is going to give feedback to our controller once the uh, desired amount of odorant has fallen into the pipeline. Uh, the solenoid will shut again and we're waiting for more gas to flow. So again, very, very simple. Uh, we really only have one moving part in this system. Uh, and then the metering valve being a fixed, uh, a fixed adjustment. As long as you uh, set this metering valve to meet your highest flow rate, which you can set a manual gas rate on your controller um, and do that as a test for your first uh, odorant injection, we're able to turn down and meet all of the flow below it. So this unit can be set, uh, if you set it appropriately, you can set to odorize with one set point of the needle valve uh, up to 750,000 and all the way down to essentially one cubic foot. Um, so we've got a very, very high turn down uh, as long as the metering valve is set uh, appropriately. So again, this is just kind of a, give you more of a visual what we're talking about here. So we've got our odorant tank, you know, 15 to 20 pounds above our pipeline injection. We're coming here into our odorant supply into the bottom of our regulator. We've got our regulator sense line, which is right here, which just goes to a T uh, right above our sight glass, which is going to be, again, our pipeline pressure to load our regulator. And we've got our normally closed solenoid here, our metering valve, and then our 16th inch uh, drip tube down into our drip chamber. This is what we call a sonic muffler. If there is any kind of uh, turbulence or noise, uh, high noise in the pipeline, uh, we want to be able to muffle that so that we're not breaking the drop. Um, and this muffler actually does help as, as well with absorption of the odorant. Uh, as, as the odorant flows through, um, it's basically stainless steel wool that's in this muffler. As it flows through, we're increasing our surface area, which is going to increase our absorption. Um, and then we've got our, our uh, pipeline here. Our blow down valve is uh, something that we can use for maintenance. So another nice part of the system is we're able to, uh, if we were able ever needed to perform maintenance on our unit, we can lock off our pipeline pressure here. We can hook up nitrogen to our blow down valve. Uh, and then what we need to do is we need to set that nitrogen uh, 10 to 15 pounds higher than what we have in our odorant tank, introduce this higher pressure to the inlet side of the odorizer, open up our solenoid, which we can do manually from our controller, and then just basically let the nitrogen do all the work. It pushes all the odorant back through the system, back down to the tank. When we hear bubbling in the tank, we know that our odorant has been uh, completely moved out of the system, we close our valve on our tank, we close our pressure, and then we just bleed off our pressure um, either through here or we can bleed it off on our blowdown valve uh, and perform our maintenance. As soon as we're done with our maintenance, close your blowdown valve, open your pipeline valve, open your odorant supply valve, turn the odorizer on. It's because the regulator has already been set, the unit self primes, you don't have to do anything but wait uh, for, for odorant to be reintroduced to the pipeline. So going into the component side of this, starting on our electronic side, we've got our controller. So this is going to be an all-in-one controller. So we've got our interface in the front. So we've got our HMI touchscreen in the front. We can do a seven inch or we can do a four inch, um, depending on the application, depending on classifications. Um, and then in the back is going to be all your RTU horsepower. Uh, again, we've got a removable SD card for the storage, um, and then we also offer uh, remote communication uh, over Ethernet. 
Um, we don't need any special software to interface with this. So if, if you did have a, a wireless modem behind a firewall, you would actually be able to log into this unit remotely. Um, but you wouldn't need any software. Everything is done through web pages, uh, which are actually hosted through this, this SD card. One thing that's nice with this controller versus some, something like, like an RTU with multiple cards is it's very, very easy to, to troubleshoot, right? We've got one, one standalone component. If there's something wrong with that standalone component, we replace the entire thing. Um, we can save recipe files on our SD card and actually load up uh, our initial program. So that, that typically takes between five to 10 minutes as long as uh, the operator is, is uh, trained on what they're doing. So again, very, very easy and, and very, very intuitive uh, in terms of the navigation. So going over to our mechanical side of things, uh, we've got our odorant regulator. Um, it's gonna be all stainless steel, all Teflon. Uh, the nice part with this unit is everything is either stainless steel or hard anodized aluminum. So if we do encounter some, some H2S or some other um, more caustic hydrocarbons, um, we're not going to damage anything in the system. Everything is stainless or hard anodized, uh, which is gonna be as resilient as stainless um, when it comes to these different, uh, different caustic gases. Again, we've got our, our sense line here, which allows us to have that pipeline pressure right on the diaphragm of the regulator, which means as pipeline pressure fluctuates here, we're getting direct action on the regulator. And the only thing we're doing with this adjustment is we're adding our five to 10 pounds of spring force and then letting the pipeline do the rest um, and loading that just like you would a, a pipeline uh, pipeline regulator. Got a gauge here to obviously show you the pressure again five to 10 pounds over what we're injecting into. Um, we just want to make sure that, that it's easy for customers uh, to know what's actually going on in the system. So again this is all liquid odorant. And then on the top side, we've got the gas side, uh, which is actually dome loading that regulator um, to allow us to adjust to fluctuating pipeline pressures. Our metering valve, again, this is just to control the uh, speed of the drips. It does not control the drip size. Uh, the Z9000, so the original uh, model of the strip style odorizer actually had a modulating valve. Uh, we decided to do away with that because it is very, very complex and really not necessary, um, especially with batch uh, odorant injection. Again, if we can get away with it when we're setting this odorizer up on the pipeline, if we can give this unit a false flow of whatever the maximum flow that we expect in the pipeline is, and then use a couple batches to adjust this needle valve uh, to meet the demand of those high flows, it'll be able to meet anything below that. So to give you an example, we uh, were working on a pickling job a few years ago um, with a large flare at the end of the line. Um, and we were using very, very high concentrations of odorant, uh, upwards of uh, 10 pounds per million. Um, and I believe the flow was between 100 and 200,000. So very, very large volume of odorant being injected. Um, holidays came around, we shut off the flare. We, uh, you know, just had typical demand on the pipeline, which was a couple chicken farms in a, in a town. Um, so our, our flow actually went down to, I believe, 5,000 standard cubic feet at a half pound. Didn't have to change anything in terms of how the odorizer was set. So again, the turn down uh, is very, very uh, high on this, uh, which makes, makes for not a lot of intervention, um, even with varying flows. Normally closed solenoid is going to be the only moving part in our system. Uh, the solenoid is rated for a million cycles. Typically, we're not seeing customers doing any kind of maintenance on this unit, uh, especially at low flows for, you know, two to three years. Uh, so this is really your only maintenance item minus your odorant filter, which uh, as long as you've got clean odorant and you're just doing a quick inspection, you know, yearly. Uh, every couple of years, um, we don't see a lot of issues. So this is really your only wear part. Rated for a million cycles. Our um, controller is going to track those cycles. So when you do get to the million cycles, you're gonna get a solenoid maintenance uh, alarm. Then you would perform your procedure of blowing everything back uh, through the system. All connection points in this uh, odorizer are gonna be a VCO style, which is gonna be a flat face uh, connection with an, with an O-ring um, on the male side. 
which allows us to have zero clearance. So we're not trying to dig out uh, any piece of tubing out of the compression fitting uh, and also trying to reset that compression fitting and, and uh, hope that it holds. Uh, the VCO fitting is gonna be very, a lot more resilient in terms of how many times it can be used. Uh, and it does have that replaceable O-ring. Uh, so again, we've got that million cycles and that's gonna be our, our maintenance, uh, our only maintenance item minus the filter on the unit. Nice part is with this solenoid, we've got plenty of them out in the field, plenty of them in our shop that are over a million cycles. Um, that is just when the manufacturer will stop uh, supporting them as that million cycles. So that's where we suggest our customers at that million cycles. We don't need to change it right away as soon as it hits a million, but as soon as it hits a million, whether you've got uh, parts at your facility, make a plan to you know replace it in the, in the upcoming months or purchase it uh, from us or from CR wall and uh, you know, make a plan to um, install that new component, but it's not something that's gonna fail uh, right out of a million cycles. Last part here is gonna be our optical comparator. This is the, the 20 plus year old technology. So the, uh, the drip chamber here is the same drip chamber that uh, was originally used on the 9,000. These fiber optic arrays are the same fiber optic arrays and our counter is just an upgraded version uh, of the counter that was originally used on this unit. So again, we have uh, thousands and thousands of field hours uh, on the system. It really is the heart of our system, right? Because we're counting our, our drops here. So again, just to go over uh, what we were talking about in this PNID, you've got your optical comparator here. It's sending a signal, infrared signal, one transmit on this side across the drip chamber and then one receive on this side and then back up to this comparator. So as drips fall in our sight glass, this comparator is going to be looking for a signal loss, which is going to be triggered by odorant drop falling and breaking this beam. Then it's going to send a pulse back to our controller saying that an odorant drop has fallen. Nice part about these infrared uh, eyes here is they're actually not pressurized. So these are just little mounts for the infrared um, arrays and there's actually another sight glass on either side. So if you ever needed to clean these off or clean off your sight glass, you're not actually getting into odorant. So again, to recap, you know, we're talking five components. So from an ease of use standpoint, uh, we find the customers uh, are very, very happy with uh, how quick it is to troubleshoot this unit and really how easy it is to understand. Um, I've personally trained you know, probably over a hundred technicians in the field uh, sitting in front of the unit for the first time. It typically takes 15 to 20 minutes to get them up to speed. And then from there, they're actually able to identify what's going on, fix the problem and, and move on. So again, that's pretty unique in the industry from an notarizer standpoint um, and something that we're, we're very, very proud of. So from the installation side, um, again, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, package these units and there's a lot of different ways that customers are utilizing them uh, on a pipeline. So this is at a wastewater facility uh, because there were so many other components uh, going into this project, the customer requested that we build them uh, basically an entire self-contained skid. So this was all fabricated at our facility. Um, we've got machining, we've got welding, um, we've got a, a design team as well. Um, so you've got your 60 gallon uh, tank and containment here. You've got our odorizer mechanicals, odorizer electrical, um, and then you've got your entire skid uh, all made out of aluminum. And then we have a pressure control panel uh, on this right side here. So essentially when this unit shows up, the only thing that uh, our, our install team had to do was hook up this nitrogen bottle. It's in the back here, but hook it up to the panel that's on the side and then hook up our, our pipeline. So again, under an hour, uh, we got the electricians in, wired everything in. Um, so very, very straightforward, very easy to, uh, to install um, if you want with that unit. It's a different unit. This is at another uh, wastewater facility um, and this is just standalone pole mount. So again, you've got your odorant, uh, odorant and pressure control here, got your mechanicals cabinet and then you've got your electronics cabinet and then we're uh, injecting into the pipeline here. So this is typically what we would prefer from an installation standpoint is right before the pipe goes into the ground uh, and then subsequently into the interconnect, uh, just putting a 45 degree um, half inch thread alert. This one here is at a wastewater facility uh, just outside of Tampa, Florida. 
And this is going to be our class one division one um, groups C and D. And we're also working on a group B uh, configuration as well. But you've got your electronics here, an explosion proof cabinet. Then you've got your, uh, your mechanicals here um, with all an explosion proof conduit inside. And our injection comes out the back here. And we've got a small odor and tank in a, in a NEMA 4 enclosure on the opposite side. So again, when you've got the, the two different boxes, there's a lot of different ways that we can install these things to meet the application. From a security standpoint, obviously everybody's worried about security here and, and more and more so as, as different events uh, occur, occur um, throughout the world. Um, but we do offer six customizable access levels uh, so depending on who you want in the odorizer, depending on what tasks you want them to perform, we're able to uh, customize those if, if you so choose. Um, and we're happy to uh, make custom codes uh, and, and really um, <clears throat> designate who can do what, uh, especially with an odorizer. If there's somebody who's not as skilled or, or maybe doesn't understand odorization as well, um, we don't want them to be able to change things like gas flow, injection rate, that sort of thing. Um, we want them just to be able to essentially see if the odorizer is running or not. If it's not, maybe call somebody who's uh, more skilled. If it is, you know, don't touch it and uh, move on to the next task. So remote communication, as I mentioned, the, the, this controller is very, very easy to, uh, to access, whether it's uh, via a laptop, whether it's via Modbus. We can do TCP over IP. Um, we can do Modbus RTU. And we can also just do standalone uh, remote communication uh, with, with a wireless modem. So something like an RV50X, uh, you know, something uh, maybe more secure with, with a firewall. Uh, as long as we've got a static IP and an Ethernet port, we're able to uh, access this unit remotely. We can also do remote downloads uh, of usage logs and of alarm logs through, through FTP uh, if the gas company does have an FTP protocol that they're using. It looks like we got another question here. So is the nitrogen supply open to the odorant tank all of the time? Is contamination nitrogen still endure with odorant a concern? So um, Zach, appreciate the question. So uh, one thing that we do uh, on our uh, on our injection panels. So if you do purchase an injection panel from us, so we've got a couple things, right? So the first thing that we've got is we've got a secondary regulator uh, and for a secondary pressure cut. And then as the, uh, the nitrogen moves through our injection panel, we actually have check valves. So again, uh, as you had mentioned, if you had your nitrogen supply just open to that odorant tank, uh, we, we could possibly risk the contamination of the nitrogen uh, cylinder. But because we do have those check valves on our injection panel, uh, we have that secondary regulator, which also acts as a check valve, right? Because it's going to lock up if that odorant wants to move uh, the other way. Um, so we do have uh, we do have safeguards in place. Uh, that, that was a good that was a good question. So from the remote communication side. Very, very easy, very, very open. Um, if you did have a, a firewall that we needed to uh, bring the controller behind, uh, we're able to uh, very easily write on the controller, configure our IP, configure our gateway, um, and configure our subnet. So we're able to integrate with any kind of firewall uh, that is on site if you wanted to do remote communication. This is something that, that's new. Uh, this is not something that is uh, from us directly. It's actually from our controller manufacturer, uh, but this is something that's called Envision RV, which is basically a controller emulator uh, that you can use on a laptop uh, if you're connected to a, a system uh, over ethernet. So a lot of times we find that this is typically overkill if we're trying to troubleshoot or you know check on the unit remotely. What this software is very nice for is training because we're able to put, uh, you know, we're able to log into our unit. We're able to put this up on a larger screen or on a, on a Teams meeting for training. Uh, so that is something that is available. Again, this is not uh, software that we've produced. This is straight from our manufacturer, um, but it is something that's nice for, for training because it allows for uh, greater visibility um, than a seven inch screen uh, in, in front of a, a classroom. 
Here's our logs. We've got CSV uh, style logs, so it's going to be non-volatile. It, it integrates very, very nicely with uh, Excel. Um, so you're able to have spreadsheets uh, with date, time, our hour gas volume, our hour usage, our odorant usage, and also our alarms. So this helps us with troubleshooting on the alarm side. Uh, and it also helps us with compliance um, and proportional to flow injection on the uh, on the regulatory side of things. Hey, Garrett, so, what happens when when and if you lose power or your your metering input? How does manual mode operate? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So um, I think there you go, right, right, right on time there. Uh, so if for some reason we we do lose power or or we do lo you lose gas signal. So I think first we'll start with if you do lose gas signal. So uh, obviously four to twenty uh, modules can be very very finicky, especially in electrical events uh, with with lightning or some sort of uh, other electrical event at the facility. We typically find that four to 20 uh, outputs and inputs are the first to go. So that first case, if you do lose gas flow, um, you will get an alarm uh, that says uh, gas signal, which is indicating that we're not getting our four to 20 to the odorizer. Um, so there's two ways that you can set it up. The first is if it is a process uh, that the flow is going to be known uh, or at least a minimum flow uh, is going to be known. So let's say it's running to a, a factory of, of some sort. Again, RNG is probably not typically what we would see that on. But if we knew that a factory <clears throat> at the very least would be flowing you know, at least 20,000 standard cubic feet, uh, there's a way to program into our controller. If you lose four to 20 signal, we send out an alarm that we've lost our signal, but then we odorize assuming a fixed gas flow rate. Um, so it, Typically, we don't see that in RNG. We typically set that value to zero because um, we do have intermittent flow. Um, but if you did have a known flow, we can set it up that way. Uh, if you go out to the site and you know that you want to set it, again, if we still had power to the unit, just didn't have a gas flow, there's a way to manually set our gas rate. And when you manually set that gas rate, the odorizer is just going to uh, odorize, assuming that fixed gas flow rate um, until the 4 to 20 is brought back up. Now, the second case is uh, if we do lose power to the unit or maybe a controller takes a lightning hit or something happens where we actually lose all of the uh, automated functionality of the odorizer. <clears throat> so if we're in that emergency case where we are flowing, we need to introduce odorant into the pipeline. Uh, we do have a manual override knob on our solenoid. So the beauty of this, <clears throat> excuse me, beauty of this differential pressure system is we're solely using the physics of a higher pressure in our tank, moving that fluid into the pipeline. So what we're able to do is we can open up our solenoid. Again, that's the only thing that's blocking our odorant from going into the pipeline. You turn it 180 degrees. You've got a little C here for closed and an O here for open. We just move our arrow with a flathead screwdriver. So it's over to open. Um, and what this will do is gonna introduce uh, odorant through that metering valve and into the drip chamber. And what we will do from there is once we've got our odorant dripping, we can use our little drip calculator that our engineers have formulated for us and punch in uh, our, our gas flow uh, that we want to odorize assume, assuming. Again, we're not going to have proportional to flow because we've lost our uh, automation. But if we did uh, need to continue to inject because the gas was flowing, we're able to punch in. And then here we've got 25 MCF. Uh, at a half pound, we've got our odorant densities standard 6.76. This is going to be fixed again, 0.01 cc's. That's not going to change. And this blue number is going to give us the value in which we need to see those drops fall on that site glass. So, with this, we need a drop every five seconds. So, what you would do after we've opened up our solenoid uh, is we can use uh, first and foremost, we can use our needling, our metering valve, uh, which allows us to uh, close off that flow uh, and dial in what we need in terms of drops per second. And then if we need it as well, we can also use our differential pressure on our regulator. We can drop that down to give us even more control on the metering valve. Um, and we're able to continue to inject on a fixed flow basis until we get uh, whatever components we need to fix uh, the system, which is nice in cases of uh, if you do have a, a contract where gas 
needs to be flowing into the pipeline on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Uh, this allows us to uh, inject in an emergency situation and, and wait for parts uh, while not interrupting the gas flow. Here it is the are the drips actually visible in the field? How can I visually confirm that the, that the unit's working? Yep, so the, the drips are, are, are visible in the field. So we did that on purpose. If you look, uh, I'll go up here. If you look at our drip chamber here, we do have our uh, front sight glass. So we're actually able to visually see those drops as they fall into the pipeline. Um, and this allows us A, to test our functionality, the optical comparator, and then B, when we do have those instances that we do need to uh, calculate drops per second, we're able to uh, see those drops fall in the sight glass. Um, and the nice part about, uh, because this beam is infrared, you can actually use a flashlight as well if, if you do have issues seeing it and it's not going to um, affect the operation of the unit. All right, moving along here, one optional component that we've, uh, again, taking our measurement background and utilizing equipment that we've uh, used elsewhere, um, is we've brought uh, what's called our GPO 100 thermal mass flow meter. Um, it's a private label meter, meter for us. Um, it's a very, very easy to install uh, meter. We just need a three quarter inch weld let into the pipeline. Uh, they're essentially maintenance free as long as we've got clean gas. Um, and what this allows us to do is if we're on a pipeline where we're, we have pulses, or if maybe we've got a rotary meter, um, we're taking pulses off a corrector. It allows us to eliminate that flow latency that we're going to have with pulses. So instead of waiting for those pulses and waiting to calculate those pulses over a period of time, this flow transmitter will actually give us a 4 to 20, which allows us to uh, increase our accuracy on the odorization side. Um, the reason we like to use this meter is it has a high rangeability, just like the odorizer. Um, so the rangeability of the meter is going to match the rangeability of the odorizer. Um, maintenance is very, very easy. Um, and it really is a great uh, tool to use even uh, as a backup. We see a lot of customers, you know, if they've got uh, different RTUs, uh, whether they're using ultrasonic meters, whether they're using um, turbine meters, whether they're using rotary meters, a lot of times they'll just put one of these out there um, and we've got a special code that actually has a failover. If for some reason we lose flow from the main flow source from the RTU, this can kick up and, and the unit can continue to odorize on a proportional to flow basis. Touched on the kind of pro other products that we can provide because we are a, a full service machine weld shop. Uh, as well as an odor, odorizer manufacturer, we're able to create uh, different custom skids. This was a, a custom skid for a customer out in Pennsylvania, and now it's part of our portfolio as a, as a standard item. Um, so we're, we really thrive in uh, custom projects, difficult installations, because we do have uh, that capability in-house to not only design different things from our engineering and our, our CAD team, but we also can manufacture everything in-house, which allows us to uh, add a lot of custom um, equipment for our customers. This, again, is a very nice, clean system for these larger RNG projects where you may be, you know, there's, this may be one of 100 different uh, items on, on your list. Everything shows up pre-tubed uh, in terms of from the odorant tank, from the panel to the odorizer, the only thing that needs uh, to be completed in the field is our odorant injection line and then our blanket gas line and then obviously our, our electrical work. So it's very, very easy, very straightforward. So just to recap kind of our, our value propositions and, and why we fit nicely in this RNG realm. First and foremost is our simple operation, very easy to train uh, our operators. And if there is a new operator, if there's a guy on call, if there's a plant guy that somehow en ends up at an odorizer and doesn't know what an odorizer is, typically 15 to 20 minutes, we're able to get anybody, no matter what their experience with odorizers is, get them trained up and get them, uh, get the unit back up and operating. 
our differential pressure style and that uh, question at the beginning from from Catherine about these intermittent flows uh, these are very very common on RNG facilities uh, I would say typically when I'm at a startup at an RNG facility we get at least two to three shutdowns right these may be shutdowns for 10 minutes they may be an hour they may be two hours but because we do have this differential pressure style and our unit is self priming because of that differential pressure style we're able to handle that long period of dormancy uh, which is very typical in these renewable methane applications got full alarm and monitoring capability we can integrate with uh, any kind of rtu that's on site we can um, you know send out different alarms through modems uh, the nice part about that again we're not only proportional to flow so we're odorizing uh, per whatever the uh, delivery company's um, standards are but we're also monitoring that in real time 24 7 with that controller which means that we're not going to over odorize and if we are under odorizing we're going to let somebody know and obviously on the over odorization side as well we'll be able to send out alarms um, before these things become issues got the thermal mass flow meter if we want to increase our accuracy on the low end uh, especially if we've got a, a rotary meter uh, on the pipeline that we're receiving pulses from and we've got that pulse latency low cost to ownership as i mentioned before most of our rng applications don't require any maintenance on the system for at least two years if you do require maintenance our only maintenance item as long as there's not anything that's outside of the realm uh, of normal operation for the odorizer our only maintenance item is going to be the solenoid and then making sure that your your odorant is clean when it's delivered and, and making sure that your odorant uh, filter stays uh, stays clean as well another big part uh, an important part of these odorizers in these applications is going to be our turn down so our as i mentioned before we can essentially odorize from our very top end of this system and standard is 750,000 standard cubic feet an hour. We can actually go to a larger drip tube and get 1.2 million an hour, but our turn down can go all the way down to one standard cubic foot an hour without any adjustments to the system, as long as we've dialed it into that 750,000. Uh, and really the biggest thing in, in this last point, I think is super important because I believe that we do have the best technical support in the industry. We've got 24 seven support um, any questions day or night, uh, we've got on-call guys and they're more than willing to support you um, and they do truly care uh, about your odorizer's operation. And most of our, well, all of our technical guys have also been in the field working on odorizers in the middle of the night with the snow blowing sideways. So they get uh, and really understand, you know, the importance of helping our customers. Um, so that's something, again, we're very, very proud of and we're, we're happy to help our customers in any way that we can uh, day or night. So that's it. Garrett. Garrett, thank you very much. I know you're uh, I know you're under the weather, so sure appreciate you being here. Um, and thank you to all of our uh, all of our uh, colleagues for for joining us today. Hope that was valuable. And uh, GPL and CR Wall are here to help you guys. We are. Uh, we are very excited about this product. Uh, we did a lot of homework and, and, and vetting to uh, before we even uh, partnered with GPL and uh, we think this is a game changer. So anyways, let us know. Uh, thank you, have a great day and, and much appreciated. Thanks guys, appreciate everyone attending and uh, looking forward to the opportunity of working on, working on some future projects with you. Super, thanks. Take care all.